Today I'd like to talk about pancreaticoduodenectomy or the Whipple procedure and some of the contributions from Yale. And I have no disclosures. I'd like to start with a case report. And the patient is a 60-year-old female with epigastric fullness for seven years. And she has a history of a duodenal diverticulum by radiograph. She'd noted a 10-week history of progressive jaundice, dark urine and anorexia, and weight loss. And on physical examination, she is found to be deeply jaundiced. There is a mass in the right upper quadrant, just below the costal margin. Serum bilirubin was 6.8. And she was taken to the OR operating room for a cholidocoduodenostomy and a cholecystostomy. Her jaundice resolved. A biopsy was taken at the same time. Eventually, the cholecystostomy spontaneously closed. Pathology revealed an adenocarcinoma of the ampulla of Vata. After resolution of her jaundice, she was taken to the back to the operating room seven weeks later. And at that stage, she underwent resection of the, of the pancreatic head, the ampulla, and the medial aspect of the duodenum. And a pancreaticoenterostomy was created with a remnant duodenal wall. The date is May 7th, 1934, and Dr. Alan Oldfather Whipple has just carried out the first radical resection of the pancreatic head, which was subsequently to carry his name. Well, the patient didn't do well and decompensated postoperatively and died approximately 30 hours later. So what went wrong? Well, an autopsy was carried out. And there was complete dehiscence between the pancreatico and of the pancreatico enterostomy. And it was considered at that time, therefore, that there was concern that the amylase-rich fluid of the pancreatic duct would preclude an anastomosis, and that this should therefore possibly be abandoned. A two-stage procedure like this one who was considered to be routine, and the pancreatic remnant was considered to be optimally treated by being oversown. Well, these proceedings were noted further up what was to become Interstate 95, which we have all learned to love. <laughs> and two surgeons, Dr. Sam Harvey and Dr. Ashley Otterson at Yale, became interested in this procedure. And the first two-stage resection at Yale was carried out in May of 1941, and the patient survived for three months. The first one-stage procedure was carried out later that year in July of 1941, and the patient remained alive for at least nine months. So clearly, it was a better, uh, better procedure, right? And a strong consideration was being made that there should be a one-stage procedure, and there should be a reanastomosis of the pancreatic duct to the GI tract. And pancreaticoduodenectomy in its current form was recognized and accepted probably around about the late 1940s. But over the next 40 years, over 40 modifications of this procedure were carried out. And the operative mortality in the 1970s was very high. It was approximately 15 to 20%. 20, 15 to 20%. And I recollect in the 1980s going to a conference as a resident where a reported mortality rate of 35% was, uh, was reported. And there was a call for the abandonment of this procedure because of the exorbitantly high mortality rate. The morbidity rate was high too. The length of stay was 25 to 35 days. And people at Yale, like Dr. Howard Spiro in the late 1980s, were called, uh, called for, and rightly so, a reevaluation of the utility of this procedure because of the excessive morbidity. And the morbidity was subsequently improved. However, the operation of pancreatic oduodenectomy was, was not a straightforward one, and it was not routine. There were biliary stents that were placed. There were pancreatic stents there was, that were placed. Operative drains were, were used. Gastrostomies were often present. Jejunostomies were often present. And patients all had nasogastric tubes as well. But over time, many of these interventions disappeared. But operative drains and the placement of nasogastric tubes, as you will hear, persisted. It also became apparent that the optimal results were obtained in high-volume centers by high-volume surgeons. And it was really the high-volume center that was more important than the high-volume surgeon because excellent intensive care units were mandatory. Outstanding interventional radiologists who could salvage complications really helped. Excellent PAs and nurses who could identify patients who were not progressing around the normal, far, the normal pathway and be able to intervene appropriately all helped with the actual outcomes. 
And so the operative mortality in the 2000s dropped. Instead of being up to 20% in the 2000s in centers of excellence and in high volume centers, the operative mortality for the Whipple procedure was below 3%. We evaluated our data with 403 patients between 2006 and 2016, and the operative mortality was 1.9%. Correspondingly, the length of stay came down to approximately 8 to 11 days by report in the 2000s, and our data revealed an a length of stay of 7.7 .7 days. But the morbidity remained high. And so we therefore elected to try to evaluate the etiology of morbidity in order to improve our understanding and see if we could identify subgroups of patients, those patients perhaps who were high risk and those patients who were eligible for fast track discharge. And to modify our management in such a way that we could call for timely intervention of complications, that we could simplify our care because we know that simplifying care usually re relates to improved outcomes, and that we would be able to identify cohorts of individuals who were candidates for early discharge. One of the major complications that we see with pancreatic or duodenectomy is delayed gastric emptying, and this is perhaps the commonest one. It occurs, reportedly so, between 13 and 44% and of the time and is associated with increased length of stay. The definition is the need for a postoperative nasogastric suction for greater than four days, reinsertion of a nasogastric tube, or the inability to tolerate a regular diet after day seven. The second complication as far as incidence is concerned, and the complication which is most associated with procedural reintervention is pan postoperative pancreatic fistula, exactly as was seen by Dr. Uh, Dr. Whipple. The incidence is between 6 and 25%, and the course can be benign or really severe and relates to mortality. The definition is any measurable drain output with an amylase greater than three times serum after postoperative day three. We decided to evaluate delayed gastric emptying first. And we looked at 23 different variables to try to predict which of these variables would be associated with delayed gastric emptying. We had 235 patients, and in this group, we had an incidence of 17, 17 to 18% of individuals had delayed gastric emptying. Nine risk factors came out on univariant analysis as being associated, but on multivariant analysis, only two risk factors were present, pancreatic fistula formation and pancreatic abscess formation. And we concluded, therefore, that it was more likely the perturbation of the operative bed by a secondary complication, which is the dominant risk factor for delayed gastric emptying. As it seemed that nasogastric tube placement did not really relate to delayed gastric emptying, and because we know that there are complications of that, we decided to evaluate whether it was necessary to continue to place nasogastric tubes, and our hypothesis was that the majority of patients who undergo Whipple procedures could forego the routine placement of NG tubes. We had two groups of patients of 125 each. The first had routine placement and the second selective. And it appeared that the incidence of the, the, the need for these tubes were, was approximately the same as far as the duration is concerned. What was noted is that the reinsertion rate of a nasogastric tube was about the same. However, in the group where we had selective nasogastric tube placement, there was, in, there was decreased time to dietary, dietary tolerance, and the length of stay was significantly reduced. In conclusion, the selective in, in, in the selective group of patients, 84% of, of patients were spared a nasogastric tube completely, with no increase in NG tube replacement, but with decreased lengths of stays, decreased time to dietary tolerance, and no increased operative mobility. And in conclusion, as with other forms of abdominal surgery, selective nasogastric tube placement appears to be an acceptable treatment strategy, and we do believe associated with a decreased morbidity. Operative drain placement and pancreatic fistula is important, and most surgeons would, cons would consider that the placement of operative drains should be routine, either for the detection or the mitigation of um, pancreatic fistulae, and sometimes for the early drainage of, of biliary or enteric and anastomotic, anastomotic disruption. The need, however, has been challenged, and in 2001, a randomized trial from Memorial Sloan Kettering suggested that based on their results, 
closed suction drainage should not be considered mandatory or even standard after pancreatic resection. However, this was not routinely accepted by a majority of, uh, of surgeons, and what did the Yale data show? We had two consecutive cohorts of patients of 50 in each. One had selective drainage, 30%, and the second group had no drainage. In group one, the pancreatic fistula rate was 22.6%, and in group two, the pancreatic fistula rate was only 7.5%. There was no increased morbidity, and there was no increased need for procedural reintervention. And we, we created a validation cohort subsequently in whom 7, of pa 7 patients, only 3%, had the placement of a drain. And the drains were placed for anastomotic fidelity or obvious contamination of the field. And in 237 patients, we, we analyzed, the mortality rate was 1.3%, which was quite acceptable. And we therefore concluded that in properly selected patients after pancreatic or duodectomy, this can be safely performed with rare employment of surgical drains. So how do we identify patients who are at low risk? And a group in Boston created a fistula risk score. They identified four key risk factors, pancreatic texture, firmer being better, indication for surgery, pancreatic cancer being better, the size of the pancreatic duct, obviously larger, being better, and operative blood loss. And they gave a score to each of these factors. And with the higher scores that were present, there was an increased incidence of pan postoperative pancreatic fistula. So we decided to see whether our data could validate this. And regarding the FRS metric, patients at Yale New Haven Hospital tended to have a lower FRS. The negative predictive value of the FRS was strong. In other words, we could pretty easily predict those individuals who are not going to have fistulae. But the positive predictive value was not very good. And we also noticed, because our patients were patients who did not have drains routinely, that patients without drains tended to present later. They often presented on readmission. Diagnosis and treatment was pretty much the same as patients with drains and outcomes did not to seem to be adversely affected. But we were concerned with the fact that they were presenting later, and we were concerned with the fact that they were presenting on readmission. And we asked ourselves, can there be an alternative objective data measurement that could substitute for the lack of a drain? So we'll hold that thought for a minute. Round about the same time, we were asking a question whether we could get an improved result with pancreaticogastrostomy versus pancreaticojejunostomy. And the reason we were asking this was because the European um, investigators were, were suggesting that it was a more durable anastomosis, securing the pancreas to the stomach rather than to the jejunum. But it was pretty clear that it would be impossible for us to answer this question if we were to stratify patients according to the risks of the fistula risk score. And so we could not carry it out. However, several manuscripts were confirming this, but there was some concern that in the United States, the data was conflicting. We were very fortunate at that stage to be able to join a consortium of pancreatic surgeons who were able to accumulate their data together. And we were able to evaluate over 5,000 patients who had pancreatic or duodenectomies, both in the United States as well as in Europe, certainly one of the largest studies. And we were able to evaluate, according to risk score, the difference between pancreatic or gastrostomy and pancreatic or jejunostomy. And we found that pancreatic or gastrostomy was not, improved, was not associated with an improved fistula rate within any risk zone. And therefore, the need for this procedure could easily be abandoned. So let's come back to the more objective data. C-reactive protein is an acute phase reactant that binds to the surface receptors of dying cells. It has been shown that it correlates with anastomotic leaks in the gastrointestinal tract, most notably for colorectal anastomoses. And our hypothesis was that CRP would correlate with pancreatic fistula, fistula formation following a Whipple procedure. And we therefore measured CRP daily postoperatively in 140 consecutive patients. Our preliminary findings showed that on postoperative day two, mean CRP was increased from 196 to 271 in patients who were ultimately found to harbor a fistula or abscess. We then began to collaborate with the Yale Statistic Department, and they were able to do some very sophisticated statistic for, statistics for us. And using mathematical modeling, they revealed two best fit scenarios. On postoperative day two to four, 
a maximum CRP of greater than 275 will deal to 96% sensitivity for predicting postoperative pancreatic fistula or abscess. However, if between postoperative, if during postoperative day two and four, the mean CRP was greater than 275, there was an 86% specificity in predicting POPF or abscess. And the utilization of both these criteria would provide excellent accuracy and minimize false positives and false negatives, allowing us to intervene more appropriately and quickly on patients who we thought were at high risk. Of note, however, as well, that the opposite of this, a CRP that was less than 200 milligrams per liter on postoperative day three was a negative predictive value of 98.7% for POPF or, or, or abscess. And this applied to 47% of patients. So it applied to a good number of patients. So we could say that if we had a patient with a CRP of less than 200 on postoperative day three, this patient would be an ideal candidate for fast track discharge. And we also noted that CRP has better predictive value for abscess and fistula than fever, white count, or platelet count. And addition of CRP to the fistula risk score improved prediction of PRPF compared to FRS alone. And so we were able to review, as a result of this, our, mo our most recent 160 patients in whom these interventions have been uh, introduced. We noted that, our, um, that only 1.8% of patients had nasogastric tubes placed at the time of surgery, and less than 10% of our total cohort required, required nasogastric tube placement. Only 7.5% of patients required drains, and the ICU stay was just one day. Delayed gastric emptying was 16%, and postoperative pancreatic fistula was 11%. Blood transfusions were required in less than 5% of patients, and the median length of stay had fallen to five days, and the mortality was below 1%. So we've come a long way, and we have a way to go. But I do believe it would be true to say that the improved outcomes after pancreatic duodenectomy represents one of the success stories in general surgery over the last 30 years.